today, uh, so most of this course is going to focus on um, companies and what econ or what economists call firms and how they behave. Um, and basically, firms are kind of bundles of physical assets, people, and technology that we'll typically treat as sort of coherent, profit-maximizing individuals. Um, and we'll thus, like, very rarely spend much time looking inside exactly what a firm is. And so I think it's useful to start out uh, by, you know, thinking a little bit about what the heck this thing that's going to be uh, the focus of all of our analysis really is. So today I'm going to try to talk a bit about what firms are as legal entities. Um, what should and do firms maximize? What conflicts arise within companies that limit their ability to maximize profits? How we can govern and finance companies to try to minimize these problems? Uh, as well as why firms exist at all, why everything can't just be done by the market, and some theories of that, uh, as well as alternative to firms, um, and a bit about what we, what we really mean in the end by what firms wrap up. So, um, there are basically six legal types of firms uh, the, it, that exist in most developed countries, but there is lots of variations uh, on these. Um, one is sole proprietorships, which is basically like a mom and pop store, most of the stores say on 57th Street. Um, or uh, most McDonald's, for example, are actually franchises that are owned by an individual person who runs that McDonald's, even though they get the right uh, to it from, from uh, McDonald's. And basically, a sole proprietorship is just like a lemonade stand. I mean, it's basically just you out there uh, doing something on your own. You have no more protections uh, and no more benefits than if you were just an individual doing the thing on your own. So also, what sole proprietorship means is that you just run the business yourself. A partnership goes one step further, which is it's a group of people who get together, and they all share the liabilities and uh, the benefits of the company. So um, any person in the company can be sued uh, if the company does something wrong individually. And if uh, some creditor owes, you know, wants to get money back from the company because the company didn't pay them back, they can try to get it back from any of the people in the partnership. And partnerships are the most common way of organizing professional groups, such as lawyers, accountants, doctors, and so forth. Um, the next ladder up, sort of in terms of size of companies, is uh, our privately held corporations. So I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about what a corporation is, but the key distinction between a privately held corporation and a publicly traded corporation is a privately held one is owned by a small number of people who only infrequently sell or buy parts of the company, and the, that tends to be a very costly, complicated process, rather than there being these public stock markets out there which trade uh, the ownership of the company. Publicly held co corporations are ones that trade on stock markets, but then there's also uh, non-for-profits and cooperatives. So non-for-profits are tax-exempt and highly regulated, and they can't give any of the money that they make to people outside of the company. They can't what's called disperse profits. Whereas um, a cooperative can disperse profits, but only to people who are customers or workers for the company. <coughs> Finally, and this is increasingly less common, uh, or at least was until about 2008, in developed countries, OECD countries, OECD basically just in developed countries, it's, a, it's an acronym. Um, go Government-run companies have become increasingly less common. But in 2008, a bunch of stuff got nationalized because the economy went to hell. So we may be seeing a, re a reversal of this trend towards uh, less and less government-run companies. Okay, so um, we're going to focus in this course, or at least what you should have in the back of your mind in this course, is usually thinking that most of the companies we're talking about are corporations. Now, um, 
Bota. Bota. What are the legal defining traits of a corporation? What makes a corporation different from the other things I was talking about from a legal perspective? Um, That's right. That, that's a big part of it. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of it. So the key thing that an existence separate from the individuals does is it means like an individual, a corporation can go bankrupt. Right? And that means that if the corporation can't pay its money, the people who've lent it money can't go after the people who own the corporation and try to get money from them. They can only get the money that's inside the corporation. And this is called limited liability. That means, again, that um, any bad thing the corporation does, any money that it owes, people can only try to get it from the money that's inside the company and not from the people who own the company. Whereas in partnerships, you can go after all the people who own the company or who are a part of the partnership. Um, but the uh, downside, if that's the upside of having a corporation, the downside of it is that you have to pay the corporation income tax, which is a separate income tax beyond the taxes that the owners pay on any money they get back from the company that the corporation has to pay on the money that it makes. So people often say that corporations are double taxed, whereas other forms of business are only taxed once. Um, Mariana Magala, uh, what do you think, uh, do you know what the two main ways that company, corporations finance themselves are? How they raise money to invest? Through, and the stockholders or investors they can yeah. invest? And the second one, through, I don't through the government? Well, I uh, that's actually not a bad answer, but uh, <laughs> in, in these days. Uh, but, but, uh, but no, that, that's not traditionally the main way, other way. The main other way is debt. So they borrow money from the bank or they float bonds. So uh, when they borrow money from the bank, that means that one bank comes in, gives them money. They promise to repay that money. And if they don't, the bank can come after them and take whatever the company has. When they float bonds, that means that they sell off these bonds to the public and then the members of the public have the right, if the company doesn't pay them back, to come and take things with inside the company. Now, the advantage of debt is that you can actually deduct the interest payments that you make from your taxes. And so that makes it much cheaper to finance a company, at least to some extent, using debt than it is uh, using equity. Because when you give dividends out to people, you have to pay taxes. The people have to pay taxes on those, and the company can't deduct it. But the debt holders get very afraid that the company is going to take a lot of risks that are going to increase the chance of its bankruptcy, because they, and they don't have any voting rights, so they can't stop the company from doing that. So what they usually do is, if the company takes a loan, they um, issue what are called restrictive covenants, which says things that the company is and is not allowed to do as long as it still owes money. Um, on the other hand, equity, uh, the issuing of shares, as uh, Mariano was saying, has these tax disadvantages because you can't deduct the payments that you make. Um, and the way that equity holders sort of control the company is that they get shares which can vote on major decisions the company makes and can also elect a board of directors which has the responsibility of looking out for the interests of the shareholders and of choosing the management. Um, there are also some things, government I should have listed on here, but there, there's also some things different than or between debt and equity. For example, there's something called a preferred share, which is basically some mixture of debt and equity. It's not, you know, you don't get quite as wiped out if the company goes bankrupt as you would if it's equity, but you also don't get all the voting rights that equity has. Okay. So, um... <coughs> Shareholders um, officially own the company, uh, but the, the um, legal controls that they have uh, can be somewhat limited. So if 
it's a sole proprietorship, right? Then there's no need for any controls, right? Because the individual runs the business themselves. It's just exactly the same as uh, if they were running a sole proprietorship, except that they have limited liability, right? But um, if there are many people who own the company, either if it's privately owned or if it's publicly owned, uh, there's a series of legal protections which try to ensure that the company serves the interests of its shareholders. So one is the board of directors, which are chosen by a vote of the shareholders and are supposed to defend their interests. A second thing is voting rights. So they have the right to vote on some important issues. Increasingly, they have the right to vote on the pay of the top executives, but they almost always have the right to vote on really important decisions like whether the company is going to merge with another company. Um, a, a third level of protections are, are often protections of minority shareholders. Uh, these are people who have only small holdings, and there's legal prohibitions against large shareholders trying to exploit uh, the minority shareholders. Um, and uh, a fourth thing is that there's legal requirements for the managers to be loyal to and act in the interests of their shareholders. And if they fail to do that, the shareholders can bring a lawsuit against them. And that's something that's become increasingly common uh, in recent years. Um, if people are getting hot, someone might want to open the window. We close it because there's a lot of noise outside, but I don't know. Maybe people are okay, then it's fine. Um, so the, uh, there are also protections of creditors, like the banks and the bondholders, uh, like these restrictive covenants that I was uh, talking about and the fact that if the company goes bankrupt, they can come and seize anything that the company has left. Okay. So, um, in this course, we're mostly going to assume that firms maximize profits, but a natural question is, is this what firms should be doing? Or, or should they be uh, doing something else? For the moment, I want to assume that shareholders uh, want the firm to maximize its profits, and I'll talk a little bit more about whether or not they do in a moment. Um, one reason that you might think shareholders would want the firm to maximize profits is even if they want to do something else, even if they want to serve some social goal or give to charity, a good way to do that is to have the firm maximize its profits, then take the profits they get out of that and give that money to charity. So, um, a natural question is, you know, should uh, uh, firms be maximizing profits, and the advocates of corporate social responsibility say no. Uh, firms should be serving other sorts of goals. They should be uh, trying to protect the environment. They should be uh, trying to alleviate poverty. They should be trying to, you know, improve uh, working conditions or something like this. Um, and Milton Friedman in the paper that I had you read argues very strongly against this view. Um, Shen Gong, okay. uh, can you tell me why Friedman is opposed to corporate social responsibility? Um, one of the biggest reasons he says is that the manager isn't uh, a principal, he acts as an agent yeah. for the shareholders. So by making the decision to um, divert funds for these um, ends of social responsibility, he compares it to essentially placing a tax on the shareholders yeah. um, because he's taking their money and using it for these goals. Yeah. And he argues that um, the manager doesn't have the right to do that because he is not like a political, he wasn't politically elected yeah. and um, he doesn't really have expertise outside his area of management, <coughs> so he shouldn't be doing these kinds of things. I'm not even sure I want to add anything to that. I think that's exactly, exactly what Friedman said. But that's exactly what I just wrote here. Um, <laughs> um, so, very, very nicely done. Um, so, yeah, Eric? Uh, just a question about yeah. you know, the, the, the article. Um, I mean, I agree with what Freeman says yeah. for the most part, but what about the situation where each individual maximizing their own profit or utility or whatever uh, reduces the overall, for example, the prisoner's dilemma or you know, yeah. tragedy of the commons? Yeah. Well, we'll deal with a lot of those problems here, but I think that um, Shen's point uh, is a very good way of answering that, which is that social policy, the goal of social policy, and that's what we'll think about in most of this work, problems. But we usually don't put some manager in charge of making social policy in the same way that we don't like ha 
usually sanctioned people going around stealing from the rich and giving to the poor just because they think that the poor should have more than the rich should, right? We think that those decisions should be made democratically by us as a society rather than by one person, by fiat. And so we you know, generally think that it's not the responsibility of the manager to figure that out. It's the responsibility of the democratic process to figure out if there's externalities and, uh, and problems with that. So you're saying it's like the government and legal restrictions should solve this problem? Well, yeah, and other types of things that we'll talk about during the course. But I, I think generally managers are pretty ill-informed about what the right answers to those problems are, and they're better informed about the operation of their own company. Um, but that's a good question. Um, so most economists are pretty sympathetic to what Friedman says, uh, unless executives are willing to take a pay cut in exchange for uh, doing something you know, good socially, in which case basically they're spending their own money rather than the company's money. Um, however, there's another view, other than corporate social responsibility, which makes a bit more modest of a claim. It says not that we should, this is often called the stakeholder society, and it says not that they should worry about poverty alleviation or environmental benefits, but that they should care about the interests of their direct stakeholders, like the people who work for the company and the people who buy its products, even beyond what they have to do to maximize their profits. And in fact, this is exactly the idea of a cooperative. So a cooperative is owned by its workers and its, and its uh, consumers because the thought is that this uh, encourages them to act in the interest of their workers and consumers and not just their shareholders. Um, and I think economists are a little bit more open to this view, but many, if not most, economists are pretty skeptical. And the reason is um, that if you think of a company as being something you know, that some uh, investors, some workers, and some consumers all come together to you know, create some value, there's a fundamental difference between the investors and the workers and consumers which is that you know, if I'm not enjoying drinking Pepsi, I can stop drinking Pepsi. If I'm not enjoying working at Pepsi, you know, at least in a bit better economy than this one, I can go somewhere else and work somewhere else than Pepsi. On the other hand, if I invest in Pepsi and they don't pay me back, what can I do? They have the money. I don't have the money anymore. I'm just screwed, right? So uh, without... Um, some legal or ethical <coughs> protections for the shareholders, nobody would want to put their money into companies. Right? And it may actually be a good thing to redistribute from the shareholders to other people in society. They may be rich, but you may want to redistribute. And we'll talk about redistribution later in this class. But um, it seems a pretty bad way to do that, to do it through the system of how companies best because the problem is if you have the managers basically doing the redistribution, no one's going to put money into companies and that's going to undermine the ability to form new enterprises and to create all the value which benefits the workers and the consumers and so forth. So um, as, as I'll talk about in, in just a bit, in many developing countries, where there aren't very many protections of the shareholders, basically the only people that the rich are willing to give the money to are people who are in their family and who are their friends, right? And that meet, that actually leads to more rather than less inequality. Um, so I think that most economists would argue that um, governance, the main goal of corporate governance, should be to make sure that the company tries to maximize the profits for its shareholders. But a basic problem comes up when we say that, which is, you know, what the heck are profits anyway? So in a very naive view, profits are just, you know, the amount that you sell times the price you sell it for minus the cost of producing. But um, in reality, things are a lot more complicated. So first of all, economic and accounting profits are not exactly the same things. So David, well, Okay, uh, can you give me an example of the, the difference between economic and accounting profits? Um, yeah, so um, accounting profits, I guess, 
um, most accountants care about the numbers, but economic profits, there's other things like um, non, uh, you can't quantify them like, I guess, like, mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, so I think a, a good example of that is um, the, you know, if somebody works at their own company, and rather than working at their company, they could be, you know, working some job somewhere else. That should be counted as one of the costs of running the company. But that's not counted in the accounting profits of the company, right? Um, another example of this is imagine that currently you guys are all in my uh, company, right? And uh, you guys are all shareholders in my company. And now I say, okay, I'm going to go sell some shares to the people in the other section in order to expand my company. I can almost certainly expand my total amount of profits that way because I bring in more money that I can then invest and make profits on. But that doesn't necessarily expand the amount of profits that you guys get, right? It just expands the total. So imagine that by getting them in, I increase the profits by 50%. Well, then each of you uh, only gets 75% of the profits you were getting before, right? Because now half of them go to the other class, right? And so. Uh, it's not the total amount of profits the company that's generating that matters, but the amount of profits per current shareholder that matters. A second issue has to do with time. So, uh, you know, the when I earn profits in the future, that's not as valuable as earning profits today. So if I earn profits today, they can be invested in other things, earn a return, and they'll be more in the future than, uh, they, than the dollar in the future would be. But, um, on the other hand, it's also not the case that I should completely ignore any profits I'm going to earn in the future. Uh, I shouldn't just focus on the short term. So there's a very careful balancing act captured by this notion of discounting, which is that I should care less about the future than I care about today, but not completely disregard the future either. So um, profits happen over time. An even more difficult issue is about uncertainty. Which is that, um, you know, if I don't know what's going to maximize profits, how can I do it? Well, one thing I could do is I could try to maximize the expected profits. But even that is not really very uh, well defined because um, it's not really the expected profits that I care about. You know, if the company is doing something that's incredibly risky, even if the expected profits are high, that might not be very good, right? And one solution that has been proposed to this is to, that a company should maximize its stock market value. Because this will include all of the uncertainty and all of the discounting uh, in its value. So, um, Connie uh, Nan? Okay. Um, what, uh, what are some of the problems with using stock market value as something that companies try to maximize? Yeah. So there are like the proprietorships and other companies that aren't operations in the last two Yeah. That's a good point. And it only shows you what the value of it is today, and you don't know if it's going to change in the future. Yeah, no, those are those are good those are good points. I think on your second point, I think the uh, the real issue is that I think we've been observing if anyone who follows the stock market here notice that markets do lots of crazy shit, right? So they're up and they're down, and it's like this guy's guessing what the other guy's going to think, and then, nah, 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 nah. and how much of that is really like the long-run value of the company, and how much of it is just this guy guessing what the other guy's going to guess, the other guy's going to guess, uh, or even worse than that, just like completely irrational, fear-based, whatever, uh, might not be a very good guide to what a firm should actually be trying to maximize. Right. Now, these are all complications that we're going to largely ignore during most of the course uh, because with regards to a lot of the issues that we're going to be talking about, they're not going to be super relevant. All the different notions you use might be quite similar, but it's an important thing to keep in mind uh, in the back of your head when they do matter. Um, another set of problems is that different shareholders may not necessarily agree on the goals of the firm. 
So some shareholders might believe in corporate social responsibility, or, you know, and that sounds good, right? But they might also believe in uh, some bad things, uh, which are also not profit mechanizing. So, for example, during the 50s uh, in the United States, there was, uh, a, there was a lot of fights on the boards of companies about whether the company should be hiring and selling products to black people, right? And some people wanted to maximize profits, which involved selling it in, you know, uh, poorer black communities. And other people didn't want to because they, they basically were, were racist, right? And so companies avoiding profit maximizing can be uh, to do, you know, some social responsibility thing that they might think is good, or to do something that they might think is very harmful. Um, and a common response that economists have to this is, again, that, you know, if people want to spend money on uh, some social goal, the company should ma maximize its profits, and then people should spend the money they get out of that on whatever social goal they have. Um, it's also important that different shareholders may have different perspectives on risk. So, um, you know, some shareholders might be working, uh, might be very risk averse, some might be uh, less risk averse, and some might um, <coughs> be working at a steel factory, and others might be working in the construction industry. So, someone working at a steel factory really doesn't want the company to be invested in steel, because then when the price of steel goes down, they both lose their investments and their job. And that's really bad for them, right? Someone who works in the construction industry really does want them to invest in steel, right? Because then when the price of steel goes up, they're hedged against the fact that the construction industry will go down by the fact that they make more money on their investment. Um, there are also different classes of shareholders. So the preferred shareholders may have different interests than the common shareholders. This is not a problem at most, most companies because there aren't that many there aren't that many preferred shareholders at most companies. But a bigger problem is that there might be one large shareholder at the company uh, who can create problems for others. So why might Melanie Melanie? What why might having one large shareholder create a problem for other shareholders? So they're like the large shareholder will dominate like the decision of the shareholder. And how could that be bad for the other shareholder? Because they don't, if they don't like have, they, they won't have a say. Like, yes, yeah, so, so um, well, I mean, a particularly bad thing about that, right, is that, and this happened in Russia a lot, imagine that I wanted to get all the assets from a company and pay very little for them. What I could do is I could buy up 51% of the company and then use my control of the company to get the company to sell everything that the company owned for a price of zero to some other company that I owned, right? And so then I would pay only 51% and get all the assets of the company and completely screw over all the shareholders, other shareholders. Now that's a very extreme example, but that has, that's definitely occurred. A more subtle <coughs> example might be, imagine that I own 50% of uh, Walmart and now I buy 51% of Kmart, right? Well, then I'm going to tell Kmart to compete less aggressively against Walmart so that it benefits Walmart, but that hurts the other shareholders of, of Kmart, right? So um, the dominant shareholder may have different interests, and that's why we have legal protections of minority shareholders. You can actually be sent to jail or sued if you are found doing things that are deliberately against the interests of the minority shareholders. Now, the imperfect solutions we've found to these types of problems tend to involve things like voting. So, to try to put together the interests of all the different shareholders, they vote on what the company should be doing. And also, if the company's really not doing a very good job, uh, there's always the possibility that a corporate raider can come in and buy up all the shares and make a profit off of that by make, telling the company to do things that maximize profits. So, those are kind of the two ways that we try to deal with this disagreement between shareholders. Okay, so um, that's the normative side. But what do companies actually do in the real world? Well, first of all, obviously not-for-profit corporations aren't very interested in maximizing profit for the most part. Um, and there are a 
relatively modest but a growing sector of the economy. Um, even if they don't maximize profit, though, uh, many not-for-profit corporations are interested in making sure they're still making money back. So, for example, if you look at the Grameen Bank, which is a micro-lender that lends to poor people in developing countries, they do care quite a bit about getting their money back because they want to be able to make more loans. And that can ask, lead them to act in a way that's more profit-maximizing than you might think, given that they were a not-for-profit. Cooperatives take, to some extent, into account consumer and worker interests, but the managers <coughs> of those uh, corporations need to actually get money in order to pay themselves. And if they're interested in paying themselves more than they're interested in serving the consumer's interest, they may actually act more like a profit maximizer than they would if they were you know, serving the interests of their workers and consumers. Um, State-owned companies are sort of legendarily inefficient, bureaucratic, politically driven, make lots of losses. And so you would think that they don't really maximize profits. And I think that's often the case. But it really depends on who's put in charge of managing them. So if you look at the big bailouts that the US government did, where it sort of uh, nationalized banks and the car companies, it actually put in charge managers who really wanted to pay back the government, rather than serve a bunch of political goals, because it was so politically dangerous not to have the government pay back, because it was a big political issue. So in that case, they actually did a pretty good job managing, uh, maximizing profits. But it's not always the case that state-owned companies don't maximize. Depends. So, also, you know, firms may have other goals like corporate social responsibility, as, as we talked about before. But the biggest reason why firms end up not maximizing profits is that managers don't always loyally serve the interests of their shareholders. Um, and this is going to be the primary focus that we're going to talk about. But one important thing to keep in mind is that even in all the case, things that we're going to focus on for much of the rest of the lecture, um, when managers don't serve the interests of their shareholders, it's still the case that if managers want to have money to waste or to do something with, they have to earn that money first. Right? And so with regards to a lot of the problems we're going to think about, like how the f much the firm charges for its product or what types of products it chooses to sell, firms will act a lot more like a profit maximizer than you might initially think. Because they want the money, maybe not to give to the shareholders, but for some purpose of their own. OK. So the um, principal agent problem, which is the problem between uh, the people who own the company and the people who manage the company, shows up all over economics. And a simple example of it is the relationship between you and your parents now that you're off at college. So your parents probably want you to learn a lot, to achieve career success, etc. And you probably want to do some of that too, but you probably also might want to party a bit. You, um, and so what they may want to do is give you some amount of incentive to do better in school, either by screaming at you if you don't do well in school, by paying you for the grades you get, or, or, or whatever. right? Um, and as a result, you may want to hide information about the grades that you get if they're not so good. Right. Um, they also might want you to study a different subject than you want to study, right? They might say, um, you know, why don't you become an engineer or why don't you do economics rather than studying literature or psychology or whatever, right? And um, uh, so what you might do is you might lie to them and say, look, I tried to do all those things. I just couldn't do it. I was doing really badly in those classes. When in reality, uh, you might have been doing per, you know, perfectly fine, but you didn't try because you, uh, uh, because you wanted to do something else. Maybe they want you to go to a professional school. Uh, they want you to become a doctor or a lawyer or a business person, and you'd rather go to graduate school, right? And so you might um, you know, lie to them about which courses, what the course prepares you for, make it you know, look like you're taking courses that will be good to get you into medical school, but will actually be getting you into a biology PhD or something like that. Right? Um, so you know, the problem they face is how can they relate to you in a way that encourages you to serve their interests? They have a basic conflict, which is you obviously know what's going on at school a lot better than they do. right? And so they can't just like tell you what you should be doing. But on the other hand, 
They also don't want you to just do whatever you want because that's not going to uh, be in their interests uh, very well either. And so this is a crucial problem for companies. When someone gives their money to a manager to go and you know, start a company, they face exactly this type of a problem. The manager knows more about what's going on in the company, but uh, they don't necessarily serve the interests of the owner. So, um, and it's not just the manager that's hired by the owner. The managers themselves hire managers. And those managers have their own interests in mind and not the interests of the manager in mind. And those managers hire managers who have their own interests in mind and not the interests of their uh, managers in mind. And eventually you get down to the low-level worker who, again, <coughs> has his own interests in mind rather than the interests of the company in mind. So this is uh, what I say is sort of turtles all the way down. I don't know if anyone knows of that story. But the idea is there's this whole hierarchy of people, each of whom is self-interested rather than looking out for the interest of the company. So it's actually kind of amazing, not how badly companies work, but how well they manage to work, given how many layers of conflict there are within most companies. Um, so the ideal situation from this perspective uh, would be that the person who manages the company is the same person who owns it. Um, Chanel, hey, what, what, why would that be the ideal situation? Um, well, because if the manager, basically, if you're making it so simplified that it's just like a manager owns its own thing, then yeah. he's only responsible for himself yeah. and the, I guess, company. Yeah. And that if he wants to do things on its own, it's also doing things for the company. So yeah. it's the same interest. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's exactly right. So um, basically, he doesn't have any conflict. There's no principal agent problem. If it was your parents who were at school, right, then they would always do what was in their own interest. So um, the problem is that this is usually not really practical because there are many people who are very talented who might be good people to start businesses, but who don't have any money currently, right? And so some people are talented business starters, some people are rich. And unless those are exactly the same people, it's going to be really important to uh, be able to have some way that the rich people can give their money to the talented people to start the business, right? And um, there is a way that even if the person didn't have the money, we could still, you know, make him really worry about doing what's in the interest of the uh, owner. We could do what's called make him the residual claimant. So residual claimant is someone who takes on all the costs of what the company experiences. But if you do that with someone who has very little money, we can't do it by just finding him money if he doesn't perform. We'd have to do something like throw him in jail or torture him, you know, if he didn't do a good job. And I think most of us would be hesitant to enter into that type of a relationship with a company that we were trying to start because we would be too afraid that there would just be some risk out there that we had no control over that would lead the company to do bad and we'd end up, you know, in, in a terrible situation, right? So the problem is that in countries where there aren't good solutions to this principal agent problem, where there aren't good protection of the, sharehold, of the shareholders against the managers, um, basically, the only thing you can do is run the company yourself or get someone in your family to run the company who you know will look after your interests. And that's a primary reason why in de developing countries there's so much nepotism and so <coughs> many family-run uh, companies. And that's a big source of inequality. And a lot of people are really opposed to nepotism. But, you know, if you think about it, it's not necessarily a bad thing given what's going on because it's the only way that you can trust that you're going to get your money back if there's no legal protections. But on the other hand, it's really uh, bad from society's perspective that we don't have some other method of doing this, and it's a major source of perpetuating inequality that there's no way for someone who's talented to get money uh, to start a company because there aren't legal protections. So that's exactly the reason why economists believe in protecting the shareholders' interests, even if they don't necessarily sympathize with the shareholders, because it helps 
uh, actually reduce inequality by helping talented but poor people get money to start companies. Um, this problem of incentives, the principal agent problem, is a very general problem of economics. And we're going to be coming back to it a lot throughout the course. So I'm just going to give a brief and pretty informal uh, introduction to some of these issues. Okay. So um, if you think about what you would learn when you did an MBA, what is the essence of management? It's basically trying to find ways to give incentives to your workers to actually do a good job. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. So uh, where's Rishan? Yeah, hey, Rishan. What, what are some examples of incentives or ways that companies get their workers to do a good job? Um, in their salary package, it could include like stock options uh, or like uh, provide them like uh, part, part of the company. Yeah. Um, they can also provide them like an increased competition uh, compensation based on like the amount of output they have. Yeah. Uh, so like if they do well, then they're uh, rewarded for that for for, for the wealth and market. And then you can have like some other sort of uh, I guess work balancing in which. Yeah. Uh, you incentivize them to take care of their like professional life, so it translates into I mean uh, personal life, it translates into them into doing well in their professional life. Yeah, so those are all uh, very good examples. So um, I'm going to sort of go down a list, which is going to start with the things that economists usually focus on, which are very hard, you know, uh, money-based type things, and then go to other things which I think are just as important for encouraging people to do a good job, but which aren't quite so hard in some sense. So equity, stock options, uh, stock options is the right to buy a company at a certain price, are ways of making the, if you give those to a manager, he'll care more about how the firm does. Um, another thing you can do is, which was sort of similar to what Drishan was saying as well, is you, you can have uh, compensation rather than being given directly to someone, you can put it into a pot, and say the person can only get that if the company is still around in five years and it doesn't go bust. Or if, you know, uh, if the company does better in, in future years. So that's called contingent, deferred, or vesting compensation. And one example of that is making the managers of the company personally liable for things that go wrong at the company. Clawbacks are another example, which is when you give the money to the person, but the uh, if something goes wrong, the investors have the right to come back and take the money back. Um, another thing you can do is you can just directly monitor people. And in fact, at a lot of low-level jobs, that's exactly what a manager does. His job is to make sure that the people aren't slacking off. And if he's slacking off, he screams at them and he threatens to fire them and so forth, right? Um, another, uh, another thing that is used sometimes is <coughs> audits or lawsuits. So um, a company can be audited periodically to make sure they're not doing funny business, right? And, and then if they are, the, a lawsuit can be brought against them by their uh, shareholders. And that's actually become increasingly popular, bringing lawsuits against managers for not doing what's in the interest of their shareholders. Um, another thing that uh, is often used is you can use the fear of losing a job. So if people are really afraid of losing their job, right? Then, uh, then they'll be really careful to do their job well because they know that there's this threat of them being fired. And so you might actually pay someone more than it's worth to have them just to make sure, or more than the least that you could pay them, just to make sure that they really value their job and are afraid to lose it. Right? That's called an efficiency wage. Um, you can also pay people bonuses. So based either on some you know, specific performance, as Vrushank was suggesting, but also you know, your boss just evaluates, did you do a good or a bad job this year, and pays you a bonus if he, thinks you, he or the, she thinks you did a good job. Then there are also uh, softer things, like you could care about your reputation. So you want to do a good job because you're afraid that if you don't get a good job, you'll be a, a reputation for being lazy, and then no one will want to hire you in the future. Right? Um, will be a, a reputation for being lazy, and then no one will want to hire you in the future. Right? Um, another thing which is even softer, but I think is very important, is many co companies have like a very strong culture. So 
you know, I think of myself as a professor at the University of Chicago. Professor at the University of Chicago, you know, I have a responsibility to, uh, you know, be a good teacher or whatever. Because, you know, that becomes a part of who I am and what defines for me, like, you know, what is success in life, right? And if companies or institutions uh, try to sort of indoctrinate people and instill in them an idea of, like, you know, what the company's all about, that can help lead people to believe that they have a responsibility uh, to do certain things, even if they're not being watched or paid for. Um, and that's very common, especially in professions. So when you go to professional school in law or medicine, you take all these oaths, they tell you about this is what a doctor does. A doctor's job is to take care of the patient. And that, um, at least to some extent, helps give people sort of a moral code which leads them to act in the interest of, uh, of the people they work for. Um, another thing uh, that plays <coughs> an important role is leadership. So Steve Jobs is famous for having inspired everyone at Apple because they love Steve Jobs so much and they you know, believe in his vision to, to work really hard and to make really great products. So that sort of leadership that works by gaining people's respect and admiration, but it can also work by fear. If you're just absolutely terrified of your boss, even if he's not going to fire you, you're just afraid that he's going to you know, scream at you if uh, you do anything, or you just wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh my God, you know, if I screwed up, my boss is going to come get me. Uh, that can also cause people to work harder, right? Um, another thing that can work quite well, and Google uses this a lot, is intrinsic motivation and giving people freedom to sort of pursue the things that they're interested in that actually are in the interest of the company as well. So Google gives one day a week for every person to work on sort of any project they want, even if it's not directly related to the company's things, because they think that these are people who like, like developing software and will think of something creative and maybe it will be the next Google product. Um, another thing that I think is very important is uh, reciprocity, feeling of being a team or being friends or family. So it often makes sense to have people from the same family work together because then they work harder to make sure that someone else in their family doesn't get in trouble. right? And I think the most classic example of this is the military. Probably this is the most important form of incentives in the military. Because even if people aren't loyal to their country, even if they don't care about us winning in Iraq, they're often very afraid that if they don't act really courageously in a battle, that one of their friends is going to die. And so they spend a lot of time in the military really insulating people from the world and knitting them together into this very strong team so that they'll be courageous just to help out their friends. Um, economists tend to love stuff like above here, which are like really hard incentives. And they tend to be skeptical of these softer things. <coughs> but if we actually you know, see what companies in the real world do, and economists are supposed to believe that the market is always efficient, right? So if you look at what companies in the real world do, they use the soft stuff a lot. So that indicates if you believe in that, that these are actually really important things as well. Okay, so here are some of the problems that these incentives uh, try to solve. So one is just people stealing from the company, embezzlement. And this is actually a lot more common than you might think it is. Uh, in fact, it's the main reason why most like you know, convenience stores and uh, uh, grocery stores and so forth have cameras. It's not that they're afraid of shoplifting. It's that they're afraid of people stealing from the cash register. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the primary reasons why credit cards are valuable. Someone did a study on this. One of the main reasons credit cards are valuable is that there would be so much money stolen from cash registers if there was all that cash sitting around in them. And this is thought to be one of the reasons why Japan doesn't have uh, very many credit cards, uh, especially until recently, because there's so little crime in Japan that they were that people weren't uh, afraid, and therefore it wasn't really valuable to develop a credit card system. And this is particularly a bad problem in developing countries, uh, where like investment is absolutely rampant. Um, shirking, that means not doing your work, uh, is another common problem. So that could be you just don't show up for work, or you just don't do any work, but it could also be you're not enough focused on your work. You don't spend enough time outside of work preparing to come to work or you don't get there on time or something like that. Another problem that has become really big recently is people taking too little or too much risk. 
So, uh, I don't know if anyone followed what has been going on at UBS recently, but there was a rogue trader who basically uh, was low down at the company, thought, look, if I take some giant bet and it doesn't work out, you know, that's the company's loss, I'll get in a little bit of trouble, but it's fine. But if it does well, we'll all become famous and I'll go end up at the top of the company and I'll make a bunch, right? And so, what he did is he went off and he placed this enormous bet that went bad and now the, this giant Swiss bank looks like it's you know, near bankruptcy, basically as a result of this guy. <coughs> um, on the other hand, if you think about people who are very advanced in their career in a very prestigious position, they may have very little incentive to take risk because they don't see much upside of it uh, and they are afraid of losing their reputation or their career. Um, and that might not be in the company's interest because it might stop them from doing more ambitious things that might actually uh, be good for the company. Um, similarly, these issues about how short-term versus long-term people will be. Uh, if the company uh, shareholders are you know, saving for retirement, but the company's manager you know, uh, basically wants money soon. Um, now, there are a number of other perhaps less traditional incentives that have become uh, uh, important topics in economics recently. So one is called empire building, which is the idea that a manager might not just want even to make money for himself, he might want to become really, really famous, right? And he might want to be really respected and in lots of newspapers. So he might just grow the company, make it big and important without actually making it profitable just so he can get famous, right? Um, and this is, there's been a number of studies that show that actually m most mergers are not in companies' interests. Uh, they're mostly driven by the managers wanting to become famous uh, and wanting to be in the newspapers. Um, so, uh, Maria Melgar, uh, what, which of the incentives that I listed do you think might be effective to stop people from trying to build empire? Yes, it would be tying the person within the stocks and stuff. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, so I mean, if they have a real personal interest in the company, then they're not going to try to spend so much time just on their own glory. They'll spend more time trying to make profits for the company, and then maybe they can make more money and go and donate to charity, and that they'll get famous that way rather than through the company, right? Um, and... Uh, the funny, the interesting thing about this is actually the softer incentives that we were talking about work really bad on this, right? If you give the person the sense that this company is great and it's a wonderful culture and I really, you know, uh, believe in it, well, that's going to just make them even more interested in building a giant empire on this company, right? Um, another issue that's become uh, uh, important recently is overstaying, what's called overstaying your welcome. Uh, which is that, you know, managers um, often like to stay in their job and control their company, even when they're not the best person to do it in order to maximize uh, profits. Uh, so this often happens in early stage companies. If you look at Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know if anyone saw The Social Network, he insisted on staying as CEO of Facebook, even though I think it's pretty clear that he was not a great businessman. He was mostly a good technology person, right? And so probably someone who's a bit more grown up should have been running the company. Uh, and he should have been just helping out with you know, creative technology ideas. But what managers all often do to avoid this is they get involved in all sorts of complicated things that no one can understand other than them, and to make it almost impossible for the company to fire them. Um, and is uh, Isamar here? Uh, what, what, what do you think, uh, which type of incentives do you think would do a good job dealing with that problem? Um, well, Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, 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 that what you were saying was like direct monitoring of yeah, what they're like doing. Yeah, like not actually do the work, but like monitor it, make sure that it's 
it's going to go the way people want it. Yeah, I mean, monitoring by the shareholders can, can do some good. I think another thing that's quite popular recently is what's called a golden parachute which is that you actually pay the person to leave the company. Uh, and so a lot of people think this is like criminal. It's like someone did a terrible job and then you pay them this huge amount. But the reason why companies sometimes do that is that they're afraid that if they don't do that, the guy's not only going to do a terrible job, but he's also going to make it impossible for anyone else to figure out how he's doing a terrible job. And therefore, he's going to stick around and continue making things worse. Right? Um, another example that I really like is what's called multitasking. And this happens when there are some things that the company can monitor and there's some, that the shareholders can monitor and other things that they can't monitor. And the problem there is that um, the things that can't be monitored, it's really hard to pay people in order to do those, right? And so if you pay people for one thing, they may actually do even worse along the other dimension. So a classic example of this is, you know, um, in the mortgage market, uh, you, it's very easy to see how many mortgages someone gave, but not so easy to see whether the people um, that uh, they gave the mortgages to were crackheads or like people who might actually pay the, the loans back, right? And so when you pay them just for issuing mortgages, you end up getting a lot of mortgages given to crackheads. Um, and an even more sinister example of this type of thing was that in Colombia and now in Afghanistan, they've been paying people for every insurgent that they bring back uh, dead. So what happened in both places, and especially in Colombia, would be that the military would just go around and kill tons of people, and then dress them up as if they were insurgents, and you know claim that they were uh, you know doing uh, a good job, uh, and and they got paid a lot for that. So when employees need to balance these things, it's not always a good idea to give them strong monetary incentives for the things you can measure, because that may actually make the things you can't measure worse. So to give you a sense for this, um, I just want to do a quick little graph. So imagine that um, there's two things that we care about. Uh, one is, you know, on the vertical axis, have you killed the right people or the wrong people? And one on the horizontal axis is uh, how many people have you killed, right? Uh, and we might think that there's sort of like some production possibilities frontier between these two things, right? And initially, because you're not giving very good incentives, you're at this point. Can everyone see this? Yeah. So you're initially at this point, which is inside the frontier, because the incentives aren't very good, right? Now, if you give strong incentives for killing more people, you're going to move, um, you might move to the frontier, but you might actually kill the wrong people, right? So you might move to somewhere down here, <coughs> right? On the other hand, if you give, you know, weaker incentives, or you do something like try to inspire people that it's their duty to their country to, you know, eliminate the terrorists or whatever, uh, you might not move as far because it's not as strong of an incentive, but you might not cause this problem that they do the wrong thing. So you might move to this point. Now, which of these are going to be more attractive? It's going to depend on what your trade-off is. So if you care a lot more that they don't kill the wrong people, then um, you're going to have an indifference curve that's something like that, and it's going to be better to choose this point than it is going to be to choose this bad point down here on the uh, frontier, right? On the other hand, if you care sort of pretty equally about the two things and maybe a little bit more about the other one and you're sort of willing to trade them off easily, then your indifference curve might look something more like this and you're, you'll tend to choose the monetary incentive. Right? Okay. So, um, how a company gets funded has a big effect on the incentives that people in the company have. Um, so one way that a company can be funded has a big effect on the incentives that people in the company have. Um, so one way that a company can be funded is just the person puts in their own money, right? Uh, and that's the main source for very small companies that intend to stay very small. So like a little mom and pop store is usually funded out of the money that that person has, or maybe a bank loan. Um, it's also quite common for very rich individuals. 
right? So if people are very rich, they can just start a company with their own money. Um, uh, a second form of funding is friends and family. You can get your friends and or family members to give you some money to help start the company. And this is a common thing for early stage startup companies that are planning to get big, but are just getting started. Um, venture capital is a ne the next stage that a startup company usually goes through, which is that there's some private equity investor who is uh, someone who knows something about the industry in which you're thinking about getting involved, and who is dedicated to giving uh, out money, uh, equity investments to people like you. Um, and eventually they hope to get their money back by selling off the stock to a public uh, equity market. Um, bank loans are another way uh, to be financed. Uh, public equity, which is usually the way that the venture capitalists recoup their money, uh, uh, is quite costly because you usually need an intermediary like an investment bank to help you uh, sell to the public. Um, and finally, corporate bonds are similarly quite costly because you have to uh, sell to the public. Okay, so uh, the problem set, actually problem number two, really asks you to explore some of the incentive properties of these different ways of the company to be funded. Uh, but let's quickly go through some of the ups and downs. Well, personal capital obviously is no principal agent problem, uh, as I think Chanel said. Uh, but the problem is that often you don't have very much money yourself. And this is the reason why it usually is only the way of funding something that a business that's planning to stay small or one that's created by a large, wealthy person uh, who has the ability uh, to fund a large business. Friends and family financing uh, has a lot of the benefits of the personal financing because you really care about your reputation and uh, what your friends think of you and um, uh, getting them their money back. But again, you may not have friends that have that much money, you may not have family that has that much money, and so it's a limit on your ability to access them. Venture capital has a lot of benefits. It's very easy for a venture capitalist who's an expert on your company to monitor you and to make sure you're doing a good job. Um, and it's often possible to develop a personal relationship that helps unlock some of the softer incentives. But um, it can create a lot of risk for the person who's funding you because they they have so much invested in you specifically. And again, any given venture capitalist may have a small pool of capital. On the problem set, I'll ask you to explore the trade-offs between venture capital and debt. Um, but an interesting issue is the pros and cons of bank loans versus public bonds. So a benefit of a bank loan is that it's Just easier done by to have you and you usually don't put any restrictions on yourself. Another benefit of a bank is that they can actually um, come in if you start to go bankrupt and make sure that the bankruptcy isn't too costly, that you negotiate some way out of it. But the problem of that is given that you know that the bankruptcy isn't going to be too unpleasant, you might not work that hard to avoid it. And so one advantage of the public bonds is a way of saying, look, I know bankruptcy is going to be terrible, so I'm going to work really hard not to go bankrupt. Okay. So given all of these problems that arise within companies, a natural question is why we have companies at all. Why don't we just let the market do any, everything? So what do I mean by that? Well, imagine a GM assembly plant. The whole plant doesn't need to be made up of employees of GM, right? You could potentially subcontract the installation of the tires to one other company, and subcontract the installation of the paint to another company, and of the bolts to another company, right? Now, this might seem a little bit unrealistic, but think about things at University of Chicago, right? Look at the Reynolds uh, uh, Club. There's just a ton of people serving food there, and none of them are really the University of Chicago itself, right? And that happens with tech support in many areas. It happens with legal services in many areas. Increasingly large parts of companies are getting outsourced to other companies, right? So uh, economists would often say, you know, why don't you just ship everything outside of the company? Companies are very command and control. And if economists don't believe in centralized planning and believe more in markets, why does it, isn't everything just done uh, by a market? Um, 
And questions like this are called boundaries of the firm question. Why, is, why are some things inside of a company and other things outside of a company? Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the last 15 minutes. So um, there are three uh, prominent theories of why we uh, have uh, think some things inside and some things outside. One is Coase's theory of transaction costs, which basically says that there's some costs associated with using a market, like you have to negotiate and enforce the contractual relationships that you have, and maybe pay taxes on them. And there's some costs of doing things within companies, which is that you have to manage the people and you have all these principal agent problems that I was talking about. Um, and that the optimal you know, size of a company balances these two considerations. Uh, Oliver Williamson sort of built on this to say that in particular, if we are interacting with one another a lot, and if it's really uncertain what I'm going to need you to do for me, then it makes sense for me to hire you. Because it's going to be too costly to constantly be negotiating with you, constantly telling you all these different things that you need to do in negotiating your contract. <coughs> It's better for me to just employ you. Similarly, if uh, the thing that I'm doing for you only has a value to you, doesn't have a value to anyone else, then it's going to be important uh, that I hire you. Because it's, when we negotiate over what the price of that is, once I've created the thing, uh, it's going to be very complicated to figure out what it's worth if there isn't an outside market. Um, and so the more that there are of these, the more attractive it will be for us to integrate into a single firm. Property rights, uh, the property rights theory says instead that you're not going to want to do something for me unless you uh, own me because you're afraid that... So imagine we're working on a, a project uh, together for a class. We're collaborating. You might not, that can be very problematic if I put a bunch of effort into doing something and then you claim it was you that did the work. If nobody else on the outside could tell who it was that did the work, right, then often working together, unless you're, I'm directly hiring you, can be problematic because uh, someone can claim to have done the work uh, even though they didn't and therefore they can basically get held up, the other person can get all the benefits and they don't end up getting any of the benefits. There's lots of other reasons as well that a company might be uh, together or separate. So uh, it might be useful for everyone to be in the same building so you can monitor someone. It might be useful to be able to talk more easily with one another and more freely. Uh, Having an Apple store be an Apple store rather than a separate store might be valuable because it gets people to think of Apple and I, you know, I have this loyalty to Apple and I believe in the Apple name and so forth. Uh, it also might be useful for them not to also be selling Microsoft products so people aren't conflicted in terms of what to sell to the consumers. They just push the Apple product all the time. Um, and yet, for almost all these problems I described, there's ways that you can deal with them without actually making things into one company, by just having the right types of contracts. So for example, to avoid lots of negotiations, you could have a long-term relationship with someone. So if you, I don't know if anyone here has ever been like a real regular at a restaurant and go went there every week. Now it's true, if you have a personal chef, that personal chef might be willing to make what you want more specifically than a <coughs> restaurant. But if you develop a real personal relationship with someone running a restaurant, usually they're pretty darn flexible and they'll make for you pretty much whatever you want in order to keep your business. And so in that case, um, you might actually think that the more time we spend interacting, the less important it is to have a personal chef, right? Because a personal chef might be needed if I just want to have someone one or two times make exactly what I like. But if I have a long-term relationship with a restaurant, they might be willing to accommodate uh, my interest. Uh, second, in terms of exclusivity, um, you know, many part suppliers have an exclusive relationship that they only supply parts to one automaker rather than to a lot of automakers. Um, and the reason that they don't 
and they might not become part of the same company, they might just have this exclusive supply relationship. Now, one important uh, reason why that becomes difficult is that there's antitrust laws that make it hard to have those sorts of exclusive <coughs> contracts. Um, third, if you think about like company towns, for example, Hyde Park is basically a company town for the University of Chicago, um, a lot of things are really physically close. And so it may not be that important to actually, uh, to actually have all of the you know, restaurants in the company town or all of the uh, apartment buildings in the company town literally owned because effectively they're owned by the person who runs the company town. So one example of that is that Microsoft uh, in, in Redmond, Washington has an independent gym. But this independent gym doesn't have a single customer who isn't from Microsoft. They have a special Microsoft rate which is basically the only rate that anyone ever uses because it's like seven times as expensive if you're not a Microsoft employee. So basically this might as well be the company gym, but effectively, it, you know, it's independent, but it really isn't independent at all. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. um, another example I think is Mac Apartments here in Hyde Park, right? I mean, Mac Apartments is a different company. It has no relationship to the University of Chicago. But I'll tell you, if Mac Apartments tries to do anything the University of Chicago doesn't like, uh, they're going to be in big trouble, right? Because the University of Chicago owns all the land and just leases it to Mac, right? And they can just take it back at any time if Mac does something they don't want. So effectively, they own Mac Apartments, even though they like to say that they're a separate entity, right? Um, and so I think that what this leads us to think about is whether it really matters what is inside or outside of a company, right? I mean, um, it's definitely the case that things that are uh, formally, you know, if we have a very close relationship, it often makes sense for us to become uh, the same company. But um, there are many things that you can do inside of a company that you can also do with people who are outside of a company. And um, there are a bunch of factors that I just went through that would lead you to put some things inside of a company and other things outside of the company. And um, these are all uh, quite different and not necessarily that related to one another. And any one of these individual things, you can almost certainly solve without becoming part of a, the same company. And um, therefore, um, it may not really matter that much. Or it may matter on a very case-by-case -case basis whether things are literally part of the same company or whether they're uh, literally outside of the company. And so what uh, the way I tend to view things is that a firm or company is really sort of just a convenient fiction. It's a convenient model for us to think about things. And often it will make sense for us to take one legal company and think of it as many different sub-companies, which represent the individuals who are in conflict within that company. And other times it'll make sense for us to take a bunch of things that are legally different companies and think of them as one firm, even though they're not. Um, because what really matters is the economic relationships and not whether it's formally called one company or many companies. So what we really mean by a firm is sort of a cluster of people and things, not necessarily a legal company, which we can think reasonably of as maximizing its total profit, at least for the purposes that we're considering. And uh, starting on Tuesday, we're going to get, uh, from a mathematical perspective, into thinking about how firms do go about uh, maximizing their profit.